the title of this um, presentation is Tips and Traps for Gifts to Charities in a Will. It's a little bit of a misnomer because I've actually expanded it a bit to also talk about some other traps, not necessarily just in a will, because these things are related. Um, I don't know what happened. Oh, there we go. The, the, to the disclaimer, this is the typical legal disclaimer. It just says that although I do my best to present accurate information, it's not legal advice. So if you want the real advice, you have to come pay for it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> There are a number of very uh, talented and knowledgeable lawyers that are members of the UCBA, and, um, and uh, you can uh, approach any of them uh, to, uh, to provide advice when needed. Um, and it's not only, though, uh, to legal advice. I know that some of my uh, topic today will be from the perspective of a lawyer, but it also equally applies to other professionals because there's a, a team of people that are often involved when it comes to uh, planning uh, estates, including charitable giving, and that could include uh, other uh, professionals, which I'll mention in a moment. I'm also going to make a disclaimer. Um, I'm not really gifted at using this. I tend to be reactive. People talk to me. I answer questions. So just like Tara, sometimes you miss a few, but I promise that by the time my presentation's over, I'll make sure the slides end up at the end, okay? So bear with me. All righty, so I'm going to be jumping back and forth here a little bit because it's going to be harder, easier to read it from here than on the screen. So a will, as everybody or most people are aware, it's a legal document. The primary purpose of it is to set forth one's wishes regarding distribution of um, property and assets on death. However, there are other estate planning vehicles or documents which can be provided for distribution of assets on death. Some of you may be familiar with that. Common ones are joint bank accounts, jointly held real estate, life insurance policies, RSPs, RIFs, TFSAs. These are things that by law you can designate beneficiaries on and those can bypass wills. They can be done outside of wills. There's also things that can be done during one's lifetime. Uh, outside of will, that's equally important planning. There's inter vivos trusts, including charitable don um, remainder trusts, which are gifts that can be made during one's lifetime. And there's also pre-death donation pledges, something we don't often talk about, but I'm going to mention it here. Um, I'm also going to just talk about generally about choosing, because part of the advice and part of the pitfalls that we as professionals should do is if a client comes in and if they have equal ability, let's say they have the financial resources to make a gift during their lifetime and might be prepared to do that, we have to canvas that with them. I mean, for some people, it's not an option because they don't have, uh, they may have assets, but the financial resources uh, might not be there to make any substantial charitable gift while they're, while they're living. And so for a lot of people, that's something they would do on death. But some people are able to do it, and, and uh, it might save them taxes in the long run, which might actually increase the size of their estate on death, uh, because uh, it all depends on how much you have left when you pass away. I mean, you know, for some people, that year of death might be a lot of income. If you have unused RSPs or RIFs, whatever's left over there, because it was put in with pre-tax dollars, it's going to be taxed at, at your top personal rate, you know, over 50%, and, that, and depending if you have no other ability to write that off, that could cost the estate a lot. Charitable donations, therefore, in the year of death could offset that, and that would be a good thing. But in some cases, the estate is large, and if you're leaving a lot to charity, you may not be able to use it all. You get a big donation receipt, but you don't have enough income to offset that. And so those are all considerations that have to be made, and the, uh, the professionals have to also look at those, because like I said, later on, somebody might point the finger and say, if you had given uh, more rounded advice and, uh, and had looked into those things, you might have saved the, uh, the estate money. I'll talk about some of those other items later. Um, so again, uh, the types of professionals that you might be seeking advice from might include, in addition to lawyer, could include accountants, financial planners, insurance brokers, or plan administrators, uh, as the came, case may be, depending on one's circumstances and wishes. Um, the goal, of course, is to make sure, you know, to make that the documents are properly prepared, that they reflect one's wishes and are legally binding. And in that process, it means that the professional advisor, and again, particularly from the perspective of a lawyer, um, you want to make sure that the person is unbiased, acting at arm's length um, from the individuals or entities that might later challenge uh, the, uh, the, the will or the document, and also to create and keep appropriate backup documents, such as careful notes, um, competency assessments if required, and other things that can be used and, and, and produced later in case uh, there is a challenge. See, this is the part where 
not maybe necessarily keeping up. That just went through that slide. Um, the need to take proper steps in preparing, I'm just going to move this up a little bit, preparing and signing wills or other estate planning documents applies in all cases, regardless of whether beneficiaries are individuals or if they're non-for-profit organizations, including charities. Even if you do follow the proper steps, there's no guarantee that somebody's not going to take a run at the estate or at the beneficiary or professional advisor who played a role in the preparation or signing of a will or other estate planning documents. And when I talk about other estate planning documents, I mean some of those other vehicles that I mentioned. And the cost of these proceedings can deplete the estate assets and therefore reduce the gift. So professional advisors have to be careful. Not only are they potentially exposed to being sued, but it can have an overall effect on the estate and on, the, um, on, on what's available to be distributed. If the proper steps are not followed or if there's any errors or omissions or oversights made in the process, then um, including poor tax advice, because this is often a, uh, an issue or, or omission to, to give advice, then this too can cause the estate to be depleted. And regardless of who's at fault, the estate and beneficiaries are going to get dragged in. And, and so everybody's going to suffer because the court doesn't always award costs to the party that, uh, or to the successful party. It depends on the circumstances. And, uh, and so those are things that estate litigators can explain better. But all these things can have an effect on reducing the size of the estate. And um, these uh, types of claims or these uh, court applications can be initiated by various uh, individuals. It could be beneficiaries, it could be organizations, beneficiaries, could be by executors, depending on the nature. Um, but organizations, and this is, I'm referring to charities as well as other non-for-profits, have to be careful as well in this process because if they participate in the creation of these documents, or if they're too forceful in perhaps who they refer to advise or otherwise, or if they ultimately you know, participate in the process and let's say a big chunk of the estate or the whole estate is left to them, if there's somebody else who doesn't like that or disagrees, whether it's a family member or somebody else, they may find themselves also subject to litigation. So I think it's a good idea for organizations, and I know that, that most organizations that have been in this business for a while, they know well enough to say, let's refer the, the people out. Let's, let's, uh, you can refer them to people they know and trust that they know will do a good job, but, uh, but you know, don't participate in that process too closely, other than participating in it by providing information about things that will help uphold the intention of the, of the person doing the will or otherwise, things like what are the purposes of the organization, what kind of things can the organization do or not do. Those are important and that's, that's where the organization can, uh, can obviously per, uh, participate and play an important role. The proceedings that could result, you know, could be simply advice, uh, not simply, but advice for uh, uh, and directions of the court due to ambiguity or other drafting issues. That could be brought by executors of the estate or it could be brought by, by beneficiaries. It could be a challenge of the validity of the will. And that could be for failing to comply with technical requirements, including signing or witnessing or the person making the will, the testator being incompetent or unduly influenced, or forgery or fraud, where, where it's done by somebody who isn't, isn't who they're you know, supposed to, supposedly were supposed to be. And that's also something that the lawyer and advisors have to be careful of because uh, it's, it's a pitfall. It doesn't relate necessarily to the direct clauses that you're drafting in the will, but it could have the effect of creating all these terrible things that I just mentioned. And then the claim for damages can be made for, for you know, against the various people that were involved uh, based on negligence or fraud or for exercising undue influence. And um, I'm going to, as I go along, I'm going to um, give a couple of um, examples. I think I jumped a little bit too far there. I'm going to give a couple of examples of um, uh, when we did a, uh, this Knowledge Hub two years ago, um, there was some... Um, a presentation also done by one of the UCBA members, lawyer Christine Rusek, and she was giving uh, from a state litigation perspective. And I just wanted to mention some of these things because it's important to know what things can happen and sometimes examples of poor drafting or good drafting, what the results can be. So for instance, and some of these relate to Ukrainian organizations, we had a case where a testator made a will, left property to a church, 
then a couple days before he passed away, left the estate to an individual and also signed uh, as backup the transfer of his property to the individual. The church thought that there was something fishy about this. They applied for a declaration under the will that you know he was uh, the will should be invalid, lack of capacity, undue influence, and that's that's va I mean that's valid. The circumstances appeared to be suspicious, and nobody could fault the the, uh, the organization for doing that. The only problem is is that as the proceedings went on, it became apparent that, at least in the eyes of the court, that the charity should have seen that things were done pretty reasonably and that they didn't, they didn't have a very strong case. And they continued with it, and at the end of it, the judge found and awarded costs against the church, um, saying that they shouldn't have uh, opposed it or that they had no merit. So um, uh, courts, just because you're a charity or a non-for-profit doesn't mean the court's going to go easy on you. So as part of the process is what I would do as, as, as a lawyer or as a professional is I would also verify the, uh, the assets of the person making the will, their income, spousal status, dependents, support or property obligations pursuant to uh, separation agreements or marriage contract, verify that they're competent, if necessary, get a uh, competency assessment done, ensure that they're not being unduly influenced as best that I can, and ensure that the tax aspects have been reviewed and that the advice have been obtained from a professional advisor. Failing to do these things, I may end up finding myself uh, uh, getting embroiled in a, in a lawsuit because uh, mistakes or, or valid claims might be made for me failing to having done those things. When it comes to organizations, again, this is charities and not-for-profits, one of the biggest problems and one of the biggest causes of issues is failing to verify that the organization actually exists. There are a lot of names that are used for organizations that are not the real legal name. Now, that having been said, they may appear on websites. There's a lot of organizations that use names they become accustomed to. I mean, you can go and take a look at even some of our Ukrainian churches. I mean, the, the numbers that we have of St. Mary's and St. Saint, Saint Volodymyr's and St. Demetrius and, and names like that, you gotta be careful because these can be confusing, especially if the lawyer's unfamiliar and if the client isn't asked the questions and just says, just leave it to so-and-so. I mean, you've gotta go and do your due diligence. Check the website. You can get a status certificate from the ministry to make sure it exists. If it's a charitable organization, you can verify their charitable status and charitable number. Also by checking website, conducting a search through the CRA's list of charities or qualified donees, or contact the organization. But again, even contacting the organization may not always give you the correct name, because a lot of organizations actually don't know their actual name as, they may know their legal name, but not how it appears with the CRA. If you're a corporation, you'll have articles of incorporation or you'll have letters patent. That's a little easier because that'll be on record with the, with the appropriate ministry that, that deals with corporations. Charities, though, can be registered. They can be unincorporated entities, associations. A lot of churches are like that. And they could have been done many, many years ago. And they could have been done with versions where Volodymyr is done as Vladimir and there could be all kinds of things. And they weren't always updated, or if attempts were made to update them, I did actually update it for the church that I belong to, and 15 years later, they reverted back to the old one. You know, like, like there's just no, you can't always know what CRA will, will do. So uh, it's, it's very important to, to do that. And one way that is more foolproof is to find out the charitable registration number, because if it's a charity, the organization will have it. If you use that, you can also do a CRA search that will incorporate that number and, and it'll give you the correct name. And that's, so, that's, so that's the one way you can do it. Because I can tell you, with some organizations, if I tried to find them, I, it's, it's like the word Ukrainian is in a spot, it's at the beginning. Well, if it's at the beginning, you're good luck trying to find it because how many organizations start with that? So it's, it's something to be, uh, you know, to, to be um, aware of, but that is very, very important. And I'd be speaking a little bit more about that um, the, other, the other thing is, is dealing with, generally with, um, uh, uh, th th again, to emphasize the recognition of similar names. If you search, for instance, on the CRA site for, uh, uh, for charities for Salvation Army, take a guess at how many hits you're going to get of, of organizations that are registered charities. Last I checked recently, 373. 
So if a lawyer, if a client says, leave it to the Salvation Army, you better be really careful. You better find out, you know, where have you normally donated to, what address. And then when you're drafting the will, use all those aspects. Put in the name. You can put in a name it's commonly known by if you're not sure. Use the charitable number. Put in the current address, you know, and, and, and do your due diligence. And, and that way you're least likely because if it goes into litigation and then the, church, the uh, court is trying to interpret and figure out which one you meant, that's going to cost money and it may not end up going to, to, to who you want it. Um, the other thing is, is that, I'm just going to keep, keep my eye on the time here, Sometimes, even when you visit the sites, it's, it's not obvious, and you have to be careful. I recently had a case where somebody said to, uh, they wanted to leave um, a, a gift in the will to the Christian School Foundation Canada, Inc. And, sorry, they, they wanted it to be left to, sorry about that, they wanted it left to Woodland Christian High School. And they gave me an address, I checked it, I checked the charity site, I couldn't find the name, I then went and, and I looked at their donation button, and the donation button says at the top of it, it says Christian School Foundation. I looked that up, and there's about five Christian School Foundations as well, but there was a charitable number, gave me Christian School Foundation of Canada, Inc., and it gave a charitable number. That charitable number did appear on the school site, but it suggested that it belonged to the school itself. Now, that organization does deal with registered charities as well, but if I had, for instance, only put in the name of the school, didn't put in a charitable number, didn't put anything else in, that school's not a registered charity, and if the intent of my client was to also make sure the estate gets a tax relief, then I could have had a real problem on that because that name of the school alone doesn't, doesn't disclose a charitable intention. It doesn't, it's not something that could necessarily be saved by the court under a doctrine called the Cypre Doctrine. So you got to be careful with these, with these, uh, with these things. I'm going to just um, uh, move this along a little bit more. Oh yeah, where am I now? Um, The other thing that I wanted to mention is that, uh, and this is uh, picking up on Taras's uh, presentation, although you're entitled to, to specify if you would like the organization, the charity, to support some sort of a project that's within its means, if you are aware or you've done the research and you know that they've got something like that going on and hopefully will have it going on in the future, um, that's one thing. But do not, even with these new rules and, 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 and the fact that they're trying to make things perhaps a little easier or more accommodating, do not put something in, in the will like saying, I leave it to this charity to give the money to somewhere in another country. Because if you do that, you've now you've got a, you've got a problem and you can perhaps save it, and this is what I always recommend drafting in a will, always put in a saving provision to say that if that purpose is not possible or, or, or wasn't ever possible or is no longer possible because things don't, the project doesn't exist or otherwise, always give a way out, always give the right, either another purpose or give the organization's board of directors the discretion to use the funds for another purpose within their discretion. Some lawyers will argue that's the better way to do it anyways, just, just give it to the organization, choose them carefully, maybe give them a memo uh, uh, that's not binding, but perhaps that will, uh, if you trust the organization, that they will try to put that to the wishes that you want, and most of them probably will make that effort. But be very careful when it comes to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, specifying those kinds of objects. Uh, that, that, or purposes that may not be able to, uh, to be followed. And again, I'm getting close to running out of time here, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. I'm not going to follow the... Um, there's a couple... I have some examples of other cases where, where, where the court ruled against or ruled in favor. Again, some of these are good examples. Uh, you know, one, for instance, where the uh, testator actually specified, they said they wanted the monies to go to a specific project and a specific use, and that use was possible. The organization was planning on doing it, but the organization had other 
needs that they felt were more immediate. So they applied to the court and said, can we use it for that? And the court said, no. They said, it's not something that has failed because it's impossible. Now, again, I don't know the, the, the background in that case. Was it a well thought out thing? You know, was that what the testator really wanted? Should they have spoken to the organization and maybe worked out a compromise of some sort? I don't know. But I think that's one of the reasons why speaking to organizations is always a good thing ahead of time so that you can, uh, you know, you can work, work all those things out. I'm now at the 20 um, point mark here, so I'm going to um, just give a couple of examples here. I'm going to skip ahead here to, um, just bear with me. So some, test, some testators choose to not name specific organizations in this will, but they leave the decision to the sole discretion of their trustees. As a matter of fact, Bogdana, uh, uh, through Shevchenko Foundation, we just recently had an estate where that's exactly what happened. The, uh, the, uh, the testator had a clause in their will said, pay transfer the residue of my estate to my executors, in trust the said money to be paid up to four Ukrainian organizations, including religious organizations slash churches, at my trustee's discretion to benefit the community, and then they went on. So I don't usually like that. I mean, it's, it's, it puts the executors in a bit of a funny position, especially if it's not well drafted. Fortunately, in this case, it was well drafted. It hit all the points. Um, it, 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 and, and the big saving one was to benefit the community. So basically, at the end of the day, it was very clear that the objects were charitable, the purposes were charitable, and the uh, executors ultimately chose registered uh, charities. Now, the only thing is about that process is you have to, in Ontario, you have to involve the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee because they have a supervisory type of uh, jurisdiction because how does anybody know at the end of the day? Like if you've got beneficiaries named in a will, then they can basically say, okay, I'm a residuary beneficiary. Um, you know, I've, I've looked at what the executor has done. I approve or I don't approve. But if you've been basically named, it's a kind of a weird situation. So their job is to make sure, number one, is that the whoever you're distributing the money to, that they actually qualify under the will to get it. Once they decide that that's good, then they step back and they basically don't play too much of a role, at least not these days anymore. Um, they can still, though, ask for information. They're certainly going to want to have proof that it was paid to a charity. But I'm just saying there are some pitfalls associated with that, especially if it's not well drafted. Be careful with memorandums. Memorandums are not binding, so don't use them with respect to naming beneficiaries or providing for gifts. You can use them for sort of issues that are a little less controversial, that are not likely to come into, into issue, maybe with personal effects or otherwise. So something to, something to keep in mind. Um, there are some um, other vehicles for giving gifts, and I don't think, I mean, I'm happy to provide a copy of the presentation, but since it doesn't relate to wills and since I'm running out of time, I'm just going to mention them, that there, that, and we've mentioned them already. There's the creating gifts through joint, joint survivorship. There's something called the Charitable Remainder Trust. There's, uh, we wouldn't normally use right of survivorship for organizations. Direct beneficiary designations, RSPs, RIFs. Nothing wrong with that. You can certainly name a, a charity under a RIF. Or, or an RSP, but remember, it's the estate that's gonna pay the income tax on it. So if you're leaving them $100,000 RSP, and that's gonna cost $50,000 in income tax upon death, that's gonna come out of the share of the residuary beneficiary. So again, it's a pitfall if the lawyer doesn't think about that and doesn't uh, take notes to make sure that that's what the, what the testator wanted, wanted to, uh, to happen. Um, Pre-death donation pledges, um, this is not uncommon. People make an agreement or make a pledge for a donation and then they pass away before it's fully been given. It's very important to make sure that when drafting these documents, and I'm sure that, that uh, organizations and charities have probably beefed this up over the years, you want to make it so that there is what's called consideration. You don't want it to just be a non-binding pledge. You want it to be binding, maybe under seal or using words that give it so that it can be enforced when the, when the, uh, when the person passes away, especially if that was their intent. And that's something that's important to keep in mind. Um, and then the other thing that is I wanted to, to mention is that, um, and this is a situation where if a client comes to you and says, 
I, can't, I, I don't know who to leave this to. Why don't you choose the organizations? And I've had this happen on a number of occasions. It's especially elderly people or somebody who is not used to donating or they have a general idea, but they just don't know which organizations. This is where one wants to be careful and you're better off guiding them. You're better off finding out what are their wishes, what, what organizations or charities have they supported in the past, what, what things do they want to do. Is it, is it for education? Is it for, for new immigrants? Is it, you know, what's, what, what's the actual purpose or field? And then basically you can, you know, you can provide them with some lists or places to go, maybe suggest they speak to friends or family members or other professionals. And, and then, at the, and also make sure that you are sure, do they want, does it have to be a charity or, does, or can it be another nonprofit? Because they may say, I want to leave it, you know, it doesn't matter. The tax thing is not as important to me. And that would obviously increase their scope of flexibility. A lot of nonprofits carry on great work, but they're either not registered as charities or their work doesn't fall into the four uh, charitable purposes that Taras, that Taras described. The other thing is, and I just want to emphasize this, especially with everything that's going on now in Ukraine and otherwise, um, obviously there is a desire to assist. And both in drafting wills, and obviously from the point of view of the charities as well, there's a couple things. One is, what are the charity's purposes? If you'd like to somehow assist overseas, there are some charities whose purposes actually let them do activity overseas. As we heard, that's not Shevchenko Foundation, but for instance, Canada Ukraine Foundation. The second part is, are those purposes charitable? Because if you leave it to the organization, they will, the proper advice and knowing what, is, what are charitable purposes, they will make sure that they're not breaching the rules. If you try to put in specific uh, purposes that do breach the rules, if they followed them, you risk the, the gift failing because the charity may have to say, we can't accept it. And if it doesn't have any other general charitable purpose, it may not be saved. And so you have to be careful because again, as we know, there's one thing to support um, uh, uh, medical and other types of issues, but if it's directly related to the war effort, there's a fine line there, and all I'm saying is that be careful with drafting. Leave it up to the organization to use it to the, uh, to the, to the proper purposes. Um, and I think that I'm over time here, and I appreciate everybody's uh, patience, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions if there's a few minutes left. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, just the line was make sure testator is aware that if an organization isn't a registered charity, no donation receipt will be issued. Right. I know donations usually are inter vivos, it's during life, but how does it assist an estate? Oh yeah, you, so, so when you leave a, um, a gift to a charity in a will, whether it's a specific bequest or a share of the residue, that gift is... Is a, it's, it's a donation, so the, the charity will issue that receipt and it can be used, and I don't know all the tax rules, it's definitely usable for the uh, testator in, their, uh, in the year they die, in some cases in the final return, in some cases there's a carry bag, but it's definitely used. So some people plan for that specifically and they'll, they'll say, I know I'm gonna have a tax bite here, let me make sure I leave this much to charities, that's gonna offset it and this way they maximize. So it's definitely usable, yeah. So I just wanna clear, so it does not have to be prior to the date of death, the, the donation itself? Correct, it can be in okay. the will itself, yeah. 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 Thank sure. you.